Well, we're continuing our exploration of the Epistle of the Hebrews. This is our fifth session, and we're going to be focusing on chapter 4. Now, the entire letter is organized rather well. It's, it's primarily going to focus on the Christology, study of Jesus Christ, and how he represents a new and better deliverer compared to the Old Testament. And the early chapters deal with him presenting him better than the angels. He's an apostle better than Moses, leader uh, better than Joshua, better than Aaron. We're going right through Judaism, if you will. And we'll ultimately get to the better covenant, a better sanctuary, better sacrifice, and then a lot of practical things at the end. This is the classical organization of the epistle. But what it really overlooks is five specific warnings. And um, the first of five occurred in chapter 2. The second one occurs in Bridges, chapter 3 and 4, actually. The most troublesome passage in the New Testament is the fifth warning, which we'll deal with, obviously, uh, when we get to chapter 6. And there's a final fifth one, a fourth one and a fifth one wrapping up the, the uh, epistle. But it's important to understand the integrity of these five warnings. These aren't little... Uh, diversions that are sort of inserted. Some got, uh, authors tend to treat it that way. That misses the real point. They're an integrated pattern of five major warnings. The first is deals with the danger of drifting, which we dealt with in chapter 2. This time we're going to incur the third one, the danger of disobedience, and which bridges chapter 3 and 4. And then the big one is in chapter 5 and 6, and we're going to deal with that, of course, when we get there. And then there's a couple more before we finish the, the book. But we want to understand that this danger of disobedience, this second of five warnings, is going to be a kernel topic for not only chapter 3, but chapter 4. It actually bridges them. But I want to emphasize once again that these five are a unit. They go together, and they each complement each other. Each one builds on the other in, in virtually a climactic pattern. And each will intensify up until the fifth one, which will be a wrap-up one. And all of these lean heavily on the experience of Israel at Kadesh Barnea in the wilderness. And uh, it's, we're going to look at that very, very carefully. We had out of Egypt in the Exodus a redeemed people. And yet they failed miserably at Kadesh Barnea. And we want to understand what that involved and what it didn't involve. And so... We also need to understand that this entire epistle takes for granted that the reader is saved, is a believer. And this epistle does not deal with any opportunity or loss uh, to forfeit somehow the past aspect of salvation, which we call justification. That's a once and for all, 100% done by Christ kind of thing. So there is no attack in this epistle on the, eter the eternal security of the believer, and that's where a lot of confusion occurs, where some of the passages, if taken out of context, would seem to suggest that. The warnings that we're going to see admonish the believers to press on and obtain all that God has promised to the faithful overcomer. And uh, yes, there are things you can forfeit. Justification is not one of them. And uh, these warnings represent the very real possibility of the loss of privileges or rewards offered to the believer. And all of this will be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ, the primary event that occurs right after the harpazo, the gathering of the church. So what's at stake here? Are these believers going to lose their, or, uh, what is it that they could lose or uh, forfeit? Not their salvation. That's a key point, and we've dealt with that in the past. I point you to John 10 and other passages that nail that. But what it does do, it highlights the possibility of forfeiting rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And we can't escape any of this by trying to apply it to other groups. The burden of this epistle to the Hebrews is not rescuing sinners from hell, but rather it's to bring sons to glory. The issue throughout the entire epistle is going on to maturity. Let's keep that in mind. So as we look at the outline here, last time we went from chapter 2 to chapter 3, and we got introduced into this whole idea that the apostle which is here used as a title of Christ, as, as the, the apostle to the Jews, is better than Moses. And uh, we're, going, we're going to now go to chapter 4, but we'll discover because the warning in the second of the five warnings bridges these two chapters, 
to really, we need to rec just recognize that chapter 4 is really a continuation of chapter 3. So therefore, there'll be some intensive review of chapter 3 to, as we go forward. So let's just take another glimpse as where we were last time. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Strange title to use of Jesus Christ. It's the only place in the scripture where it speaks of him as an apostle, the sent one. The wherefore, of course, is a typical Pauline connector, connecting the, what's just gone on to what's now coming. This is sort of uh, connecting the past to the, the, to the future in terms of his rhetoric here. And uh, so, and we go to uh, holy brethren, so the, this is another underscore that the readers are presumed to be saved. They, they're holy brethren. These are not unbelievers he's writing this letter to. And then he speaks of the heavenly calling, which brings on a heavenly inheritance. And that's really the whole subject here, to become partakers. We enc encounter the term metakoi, which is a partaker of Christ. And uh, not everybody's a metakoi. Not all believers are metakoi. We want to understand what the differences are. And that's going to come up again and again. And then he uses this strange expression of Jesus Christ, calling him the apostle. And the fact that he uh, calls him an apostle is a clue as to who the writer is. Paul regarded, felt his mandate was to the Gentiles. But to intrude on, uh, on this area, uh, apostle of the Jews would be a super arrogation. It's another reason Paul didn't sign this epistle. He's simply laying out some reasoning. He's not presenting it as an apostle that, he, that would be causing him mentally at least to be in, in, intruding on what's un, in his mind uniquely Christ's mission here. But then uh, we go, continue in, in uh, Hebrews 3, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today if ye will hear his voice, he's going to quote extensively here from Psalm 95. Today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. That's that event that occurred in Numbers 13 and 14. We'll be exploring in more detail. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works for 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Those are God's words being quoted in Psalm 95, here being quoted in Hebrews 3. But it's interesting to note, because it's going to be very important as we go in further chapters too, that God swore an oath here. It would be interesting just to make a list of the rare occasions that God swears an oath. And uh, that's going to be very important to understand as we proceed. The wherefore, again, is this Pauline connector that it connects in both directions, what, just, what has just been said to what's coming. And, and this is the psalm that he's quoting. Let's just examine it to keep it in our mind. This is Psalm 95, picking up about verse 6. Come now, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Then we come to the part that is being quoted so often in the New Testament. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my work, 40 years long was I grieved with this generation and said, it is, it is a people that do err in their heart that have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. So our, our rendering of it, in, as we see it in Psalm 95, is pretty, matches pretty tightly to the way it's quoted in Hebrews. But this last verse, verse 11, unto whom I swear in my wrath, ooh, that's scary, God so angry that he swears an oath that they shall not enter into my rest. And that's going to lead us to the main topic of what we're going to deal with here in chapter 4. What do you mean by the rest? So we're going to look, we're looking at chapters 3 and 4, and one of the issues that's going to emerge in our perceptions here is what is meant by rest? A strange word. and may not mean what you first assume it means. And he speaks of a creation rest, he speaks of a Canaan rest, and a Sabbath rest. Are they the same thing? And if not, how do they differ? What do they have in common? So let's take a look at rests. We're going to see this term here, of course, in the he um, to addressed to the Hebrew Christians. But they're quo quoting, I'm going to move up earlier in time, back to Psalm 95, written in the times of David. So David alludes to this same thing. In fact, that's what we're quoting uh, in Psalm 95. But that, in turn, is alluding to an event that occurs at Kadesh Barnea in Numbers 13 and 14. So they're here on the, uh, uh, listed in chronological order, but we're looking back from our presence, present time being a Hebrews uh, reader here. 
back to David, in fact, even earlier, back to Moses at Kadesh Barnea. And the, these, the two allusions in Numbers 13 and Psalm 95 is sometimes called the Canaan rest because it deals with their failure to enter into their rest at Kadesh Barnea. And we're going to call that the Canaan rest as to, to distinguish it from a couple of others that are going to surface in our study. Now, the main point here is that whatever was available to them that they blew at Kadesh Barnea apparently is still open to them because that's the point of Psalm 95. David's alluding to it and implying that that offer to enter into God's rest is still open to them in the days of David. So whatever it is wasn't foreclosed for, from them uh, at Kadesh Barnea, except maybe in some limited sense. So we want to get a sense of that as we go here. So let's continue in chapter 3. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation of the day of temptation in the wilderness. This again is, of course, quoting from Psalm 95. But notice that the Scripture here ascribes that not to David, which of course penned it, but it attributes this to the Holy Ghost. Interesting thing that, that this is an a, a underscore of the inspiration of the Word here. And this term provocation keeps coming up, which isn't obvious unless you really know your Bible. So what is it alluding to? The provocation. The Greek word is parabakrasnos, which is used only three times in the New Testament, and all three times it's in this chapter. So even though it's familiar in our ears, it's primarily because of this passage. Now we know from Numbers 14 that the children of Israel provoked God ten times while they're in the wilderness, but this particular one was the turning point. This changed their history. This caused them to take a 40-year detour for what should have been an 11-day journey. Our God is immutable. It's interesting that the Israelites, however, so thoroughly upset God that He swore on His own name that they would not enter the Promised Land. Now, many times in the Scripture, we see the term that God repents. When He's talking to Moses or Amos, He'll present something, and apparently Moses or Amos would talk Him out of it. Well, most scholars would recognize that as an anthropomorphism. God knew in advance what He's really going to do, and so He's, in a sense, toying with them. When He, he, he tells Moses He's going to wipe out everybody, and Moses, well, don't do, if you do that, then this, 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 and Moses renegotiates it. Same thing happens with Amos, where several times God says what He's going to do, and Amos prays about it, and God would appear to change His mind. It, it's not as if He really changed His mind. He's, that's His way of, of uh, communicating. And, but there are cases where God swears an oath which forecloses His opportunity to repent. And that's really the point of swearing an oath. And it, it, it would be instructive as you go through your Bible to note those places where God swears an oath. That's a very, very important way of underlining it. And so God made up, in here at Kadesh Barnea, He made up His mind and He would not repent. The idea of God repenting is a key uh, aspect when we get to chapter 6. But let's examine at this point Numbers 14 so we have this pivotal event at Kadesh Barnea clear in our minds. First question I have of you, what do these people have in common? We've got a list of people here. There's 12 of them. What do they have in common? Well, if I tell you that they're from 12 different tribes, you can begin to guess who they are. And of course, that turns out that 10 of them are the ones that brought the, back the bad report. Two of them, Caleb and Hosea, later called Joshua, is uh, the ones that distinguish themselves by having the faith to go in and take over the land. So let's take a look at Numbers 14 and just take a look at the chapter because it's so pivotal for our understanding here. All the congregation have lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night and all the children of Israel murmured. In chapter 13 is when they sent the spies and the spies came back with this bad report. All the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. Get that. All the, the, the whole nation was upset with Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt! Or would God that we had died in this wilderness? <laughs> well, they're going to get their wish. You've got to be careful what you wish for. Wherefore hath the Lord brought us to, unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? So this is the murmuring going on. They said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation. Children, This was not a casual issue. This caused major, major tension. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh 
which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. And if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. That was the, the, the attitude of Joshua and Caleb. However, verse 10, But all the congregation made stone them with stones. This is having a different difference of opinion. Okay, And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. That must have got their attention. They're mad enough that they're about to stone these two uh, witnesses. But God himself intervenes, and that must have been a dramatic moment. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? Now, see, that's why they call it the provocation. This event's called the provocation. How long will these people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have shown among them? Get the picture here. Only 11 days ago, they had, they're delivered from the death of the firstborn in Egypt. And, uh, and so on. You know, a dramatic, dramatic uh, uh, series of events. You would think they would be uh, still operating under the awe of the experience experiences of the last few weeks. God continues, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than there. In other words, he's proposing to Moses, he's going to wipe them all out and start over. That's a threat that's implied there. But notice what he's saying, I will disinherit them. Key word as we, to understand the, the, the vocabulary here. In Hebrews 3, verse 17 it alludes to all this, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that he should not, that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? I want you to notice that the rest is equivalent to inheriting. They're almost synonymous. That they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. For we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. We're continuing our numbers review. God has just indicated Moses is going to wipe them all out and start over. Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear it, for thou broughtest up these people in thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, for they have heard that thou, Lord, art among his people, and thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by, time in a pil by day, time in a pillar of a cloud, and in pillar of fire by night. Now if thou should kill all his people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, <laughs> you know, this, it's just amusing to see Moses trying to manipulate God, appeal, appealing to God's pride, so to speak. <laughs> then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore unto them. Therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according to as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according to the greatness of thy mercy, as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. That's Moses' appeal to God. And God responds to that. In, in verse 20, the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. So understand that. God forgave them for their lack of faith. He, he pardoned them. But as truly as I live, God continuing, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. I want you to notice that he's pardoned them, but even though he's pardoned them, something else is coming. Because all these men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. So even though they're forgiven, they're not going to inherit what God had given to them. Here's a key verse. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. So there's a two-part oath here that's critical to understanding Numbers 14. The first is that God, that God pardoned them according to Moses' petition. 
that can only mean that the people were forgiven of the iniquity of the sin that they had just committed. In the same breath, though, the Lord uttered the second part of his oath, denying them entrance into the land. So they're saved. They don't return to Egypt, but at the same time, they don't get the inheritance that would, would have been theirs had they had faith. Continuing Numbers 14. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit in him, hath followed me fully, and him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. The Malachites, the Canaanites dwelt in the valley, and tomorrow I'll turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear this, with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard, from, heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me, saying to them, As truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. And doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I speak, where to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, son of Jehuna, and Joshua, the son of Nun. I swear unto you. There's that key point. God swore an oath, which means he can't deviate from that oath. But then he continues, but your little ones, which he said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which he searched the land, even 40 days, that was how long the spies had to search it all out. Each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there shall they die. This two-part oath that he mentioned, as if to reinforce that, he says, as I live. The Lord repeats that three times, that their corpses shall fall in this wilderness. He reemphasizes, underscores that. And by the way, as you analyze this, you cannot equate their failure to enter Canaan, uh, or, or their untimely death can be equated with damnation. Those are not the issues here. Some people uh, make a, 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 get into trouble trying to over-apply over the uh, uh, possible analogies. Continue Numbers 14, And the men which Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur against him by bringing up a slander upon the land, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. Apparently they died specifically early. It didn't take them 40 years to, 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 to uh, be taken out of the picture. And uh, so, But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh uh, they were of the men that went to search the land. They lived still. And Moses told, all, told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly, and they rose up early in the morning and got up into the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we, ha we be here, and we will go up into the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. So they changed their mind. The people themselves repented of what they did. They repented, but it was too late. God did not repent because he swore an oath. So therefore they suffered defeat when they, they subsequently tried to enter the land on their own and they, AI, and they really, they were, they were in big trouble. So God is jealous about sharing his glory is the underscore here. And uh, those, to whom he show, uh, to, those to whom he shows great and mighty works and his glory take heed. Now if God held them accountable for his great deeds, boy, what position that, does that put us in? Because we have seen through the centuries even greater things than they were held accountable for. But it's interesting, the impossibility of repentance that it was going to give us trouble when we get to Hebrews chapter 6. The repentance that's at issue may be on God's part, not the people's part. We'll defer that until we get to chapter 6. But recognize that that's an overlooked possibility by many, many that review that passage. These are all believers. Their justification is not at issue, and 1 Corinthians 3 deals with that in effect. Judgment and not mercy will emanate from the beam of seat of Christ and with a just recompense of reward. Positive and negative is appropriate, and there's a whole study that undergirds that that you should take in on, on your own, though, what really is going on in the judgment seat. Every one of us has an appointment. Every one of us are due for a final exam before the Lord himself. 
Getting back to Hebrews 3, which this was all an amplification of. When your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation, said they do always err in their heart, they have not known my ways. For 40 years, they have been rebellious against the Lord. Deuteronomy 9 uh, underscores this. They do always err in their heart, which is exactly what Moses documents in, uh, in uh, Deuteronomy 9 and elsewhere. Continuing Hebrews, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. That is the heavy indictment that is nailed to the masthead here. So in the, in the historical sense, they've been wandering for 40 years on a detour. But God uh, took, to, took an oath. Over, uh, over a million people, we estimate, came out in the Exodus, out of Egypt. Only two inherited the land, and Moses wasn't one of them. Now, I've said that many times, but my friend Gordon has corrected my arithmetic because my mathematics faulty, because he pointed out that those that were under 20 uh, did inherit. So yes, they were, you know, 60 uh, years uh, on uh, going, so, so it's, uh, it wasn't just two that inherited the land. Those that were under 20 obviously survived to become mature adults entering the land. So my arithmetic is a little sloppy there. Anyway, moving on. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. That is the warning, that is the emphasis of the writer's focus on all of this. Unbelief is sin. And uh, to exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Today, harden not your hearts, is the admonition that David puts in Psalm 95. Does this mean that any of us could fall away? Are we vulnerable? And if so, to what? Important issues. Today. You know what tomorrow is? I love this. You know what tomorrow is? Tomorrow is the day when idle men work. Tomorrow is the day that fools repent. I love that. Never thought about it that way. What do I mean by that? Tomorrow is Satan's today. He doesn't care what good resolutions you make as long as they're scheduled for tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll work. Tomorrow I'll repent. Satan loves that. No, today is the point at issue. And uh, so today is the day of decision. That means right now. And uh, while you still have opportunity, because you know not what a day may bring forth. No, I love that. Tomorrow is the day when idle men work. And, that's, and tomorrow is the day that fools repent. Are you a fool? Are you idle? Or are you diligent and committed? For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Partakers. This is a key word, you see. We have to, indeed, God rewards those that hold their confidence to the end. But we're not talking about justification. That's 100% done by Jesus Christ and 100% in the hands of our Father. And uh, I know in whom I believe that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. No, this is doing something else. Are you a partaker in Christ? You are if, big if, you hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. The word there is metakoi, a partaker. And th there's a key if here, a conditional if. Critical important, critically important. What is it? that we must hold steadfast to the end. That's what you've got to decide as we go through the study. While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. He's repeating again this quote from Psalm 95. What's the penalty for hardening your heart? It's seen in the example of the wilderness wanderings, a 40-year spiritual detour. How many of us can look at a portion of our lives? couple of decades, in my case, for example, where I knew I was saved long ago, and I walked, um, I didn't turn my back on the Lord, but at the same time, I often have seen those, tw my, those 20 years were clouded by a, a certain awareness of liberalism, a certain lack of commitment, and I remember Walter Martin pointed out to me, Chuck, those are the years the locusts have eaten. I said, what does that mean? It's because God pr promises to give you those back, and indeed he has, and, and uh, but uh, I look back decades of uh, where I could have been so much more productive, could have done so much more had I really uh, uh, followed through. At Kadesh Barnea, upon the report of the, uh, the uh, uh, committee that they sent out, 
They failed due to unbelief. The entire generation, except for Joshua and Caleb, passed away before the nation could enter the land. It says 40 years. That's the round numbers, of course. Um, this is intended to the Hebrew Christians. Their today was how long? It was between the preaching of Christ and Jerusalem's impending overthrow. The window that's operative here with this epistle is the window between the time they first heard the gospel and the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, where it was over. And uh, so that was nominally 40 years. And that's the same length of time that they sojourned in the wilderness. Actually, it was 38. If you look at Deuteronomy 2, verse 14, we'll discover that the precise period is actually 38 years. And uh, Jesus, when Jesus in Luke 21 speaks of this generation shall not pass away, he's warning them that when the city's surrounded, get out of town, don't let your friends get to come back. It's all in Luke 21. Again, from the time he told them that until the fall of Jerusalem under, under the Romans was 38 years. From 32 AD to 70 AD is, is 38 years. So it's interesting that that generational period that here is alluded to in the Hebrews is the same generational period that is applicable in Numbers 14. So the summary of rests here. We have the Hebrew, and uh, the, remember David, David's allusion to all of this in, in, in uh, Psalm 95 implies it was renewed then. But back in Kadesh Barnea, their today was 38 years. The Hebrew Christians reading this epistle, their today was from between 32 and 70 AD, 38 years. That's kind of fun. For some, when they had heard it, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Not all that came out of Egypt by uh, they were a blood-redeemed people, but they lost their inheritance due to unbelief is the whole point. And again, Moses wasn't one of them. Moses didn't get the inheritance. Does that mean he was, wasn't saved? No, because he shows up at the, uh, in Matthew 17 at the, at the transfiguration and so forth. The people at large repented and God forgave them, but the physical consequences of their sin had to be paid. Continuing, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was he not with them that had sinned because whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that, that, that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? That's the issue. Believing not and, and uh, uh, disobedience are equivalent terms. So that we see that they could not enter in because of their unbelief. And uh, the inheritance, their inheritance was conditional on what? On faithfulness. So was ours. Our inheritance, not our salvation, our inheritance is conditional. Notice that Israel did not lose their status as a redeemed people. They did not go back to Egypt as slave, back to, you know, slaves again. No, they, they were redeemed. And uh, we know that Moses was saved if for no other reason, many other reasons, but we see, we see him visibly at, in Matthew 17 and Luke 9. So, uh, but they did lose the blessing of their inheritance in Mama's land. Moses was deemed after... 40, uh, 120 years, 40 growing up in Egypt, 40 on the backside of the desert in Midian, and 40 in the wilderness wanderings, uh, and he didn't get to enter in. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should come short of it. Is there a rest promise to you? What is that going to be? We'll get into that here in a minute. But you too can forfeit if you fall short. So we're now going to end at chapter 4, which is just a continuation of this whole discussion, a continuation of what's called the second warning here. Let us therefore, speaking of us, we the readers, and he, the writer puts himself in that same category with the readers, let us therefore fear, awe. And uh, this is first of many, let us, all through the book. And uh, so there is a, now a danger for these believers and here we speak of fear in the sense of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fear in the sense of awe, not fear in the sense of terror, although that could be appropriate too. No, in the sense of awe. Let us, uh, a promise being left us, of entering into his rest. What on earth is his rest as far as we're concerned? We're not worrying about entering Canaan, but what is the analogy? What is our rest of all? Well, the word rest is misleading. The dictionary gives you several different meanings. Its primary meaning is the cessation of movement, to come to rest. It implies motion that's now stopped, that something is stopped. Cessation of movement or action. Or the equivalent, cessation of labor. It's when you're through with your job, you rest. 
doesn't mean you're relaxing or sleeping. It means you no longer hammering those nails or whatever. You've, you've come to the end of that task. It's a state of freedom from exertion in that sense. It can be freedom of anxiety. Come to rest in a sense of freedom from anxiety, of emotional anxiety. It can also be, it can refer to the repose of sleep uh, that refreshes your body and so forth, or the repose of death. It sometimes uses that term when someone is, is, is uh, uh, been freed from earthly toil altogether. These are a different meaning. What's being used here? What's the rest being offered here? See, it's possible that the faith of these Jewish believers that this is written to is going to be tried because of the persecution that they're starting to undertake uh, at the time this, apostle, this epistle is being written. And uh, because of their present situation, they too can fall short just as the people at Kadesh Barnea fell short. They can fall short of what God wants them to attain in this life. And the promise of God's rest here is still available to them and us because it was never totally fulfilled. The promise of the rest of the Old Testament was unfulfilled and it was not withdrawn is the point. It's available to those who want it now. The entire purpose of this letter to the, uh, to the Hebrews is to get the Jewish believers to enter in to the fullness of what God has available to them. And the writer uses two different words for rest in this chapter. The primary one he uses is the word kataposis, which is used eight times in chapters 3 and 4. And uh, outside of the book of Hebrews, this word is used only once in the entire New Testament. That's in the book of Acts. But the word in all these uses means the cessation of activity. It means rest in the sense of ceasing. He wants you to cease your own works and, not, and rely only on his. The Septuagint includes notable passages where the word for rest, kataposis, in connection with Israel's possession of the land is clearly paralleled all through the Old Testament with the word kleronomia, which is um, inheritance. The word for rest and inheritance in the Old Testament sense are virtually synonyms. So what they forfeited there was their inheritance of the land. See, for them, their rest was their inheritance, and Moses clearly shows that for Israel, their rest was the inheritance of the land, the land of Canaan. In the same way, the term rest was the writer's functional equivalent for a Christian's inheritance. Now, the Christian's in promise isn't the land, it's something else, but whatever it is, it's something that has to be earned by faithfulness. The Christians uh, are heirs, is all through the uh, Scripture and all through the Epistle of Hebrews, that there we're heirs too. It's affirmed before, back in chapter 1, and it's going to be reaffirmed again in chapter 6 and elsewhere. Moses showed that Israel's rest was their inheritance, and that same thing's true for you and I. Our rest is our inheritance. That begs the question, okay, what is our inheritance? And uh, see, these Jewish believers that this is written to had severed the relationship to their established systems by ba being baptized. When they, were, when, when they baptized them publicly, that was their way of closing the door on Judaism and committing themselves to the Lordship of Christ. That's what the baptism signified there, and that's going to be emphasized when we get to chapter 10. The renunciation of the established Judaism is what has incurred the wrath of their establishment community. And they all were undergoing intense persecution, and that's what prompts them to consider going back under that Judaism umbrella, and that's what is being denied them by the writer of the Hebrew, uh, the epistle here. He points out, and they have not yet been martyred, but they will, and many will face that possibility. We're already ahead, uh, probably had that experience. But if they're going to mingle with those that are observing established rituals in the temple, those persecuting them, the concept was that they might forget that they had previously renounced it by their baptism. So by pretending they're still in Judaism, they thought they could avoid. But that's in effect denying Christ. And that's a tough spot to realize that they're in. And there's analogies today. Even Paul, by the way, had observed Jewish rituals as memorials to Christ during his ministry. We see that in Acts and mentioned 1 Corinthians. So because of all this, many of these were not assembling with other believers but were trying to re-identify themselves with established Judaism in order to escape persecution. That's what the writer is arguing against. 
And just like their ancestors back at Kedar Barnea, the recipients of this epistle had a promise of God of entering into his rest. This is not the rest of salvation in the sense of justification because they're already recognized as believers. And it's also not the future millennial rest in which all persecution will cease. Therefore, we can conclude that the rest is that faith life rest which the believer enters by faith in which he enjoys the inheritance that God gives to those that are faithful. That's re resting from our attempts and relying on the Holy Spirit's leading. So we have the Hebrew Christians here before. Prior to that, we have Psalm 95 and all alluding to the rest, what we call the Canaan rest. The offer is still open, and the today is, is as we've indicated. But unto us, for, in chapter 4, we're starting to make some progress in 4 now. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. See, these readers were without excuse because they had the gospel preached unto them. And again, he draws a parallel to Numbers 13 and 14. Twelve men came back from the promised land to give a report. And the children of Israel made a wrong decision as a result of that. These Jewish believers had received a message from twelve apostles. Remember those twelve, twelve apostles that are going to rule on twelve thrones over the twelve tribes. Remember, the, got to remember the Jewishness of all that. The emphasis here is on the necessity of faith to attain spiritual blessings from an inheritance. He continues, "For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world." Now there's a change of term here. Quote here is speaks of my rest. What rest is that? That's a creation rest, because God is speaking to the rest He took. When did God cease His works? Genesis two, the creation was finished. God finished it, and He didn't. He, he didn't go to sleep. He didn't He didn't take a nap? No, He just stopped creating. That's where most of us. That's uh, well. We actually uh, we get into the whole entropy laws, which really were introduced in response to Genesis three. But He says, "My rest." It is referring to God's creation rest. For we, we which have believed do enter to a rest. The statement that we who have believed uses the past tense and refers to the writer and the readers. They have already entered in to that, to that part of it. They do enter into rest. The author then switches to present tense. We who do now enter into that rest, presently entering into that spiritual rest. So this paradigm, he's going to point out that the final facet of the rest, the final facet is yet future. There's part of this past, there's part of it present, there's part of a future. We're going to discover the, the, uh, that paradigm uh, going on again. The point is that because they have believed, they have begun to enter into his creation rest through the final facet, although the final facet is still yet future. These Jewish believers must continue to exercise faith to enjoy what this rest has to offer. The writer again points out that the wilderness generation did not enter the rest even though God had, pos had possessed it since the creation. God, through the psalmist David, announce the continued existence of the future rest. So he spoke in a certain place on the seventh day on this wise. He, if he was four, is pointing out, the, you know, introducing an, the analogy not just back to the David, back to Genesis 2. He spoke of a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, that God did rest on the seventh day from all his works. What is rest implying here? Ceasing from your works, okay? Works in the sense of where you're trying to earn your salvation. You can't do that. God has done it all. And that's really what we're talking about resting from. This is a reference to Genesis 2. The word here, by the way, is Shabbat, which means to cease, desist, or rest. So again, we have, the, we have these previous rests that we looked at so far. So far, we we're alluding back to the Canaan rest. But now we've introduced a deeper allusion here that goes even before Kadesh Barnea. And that's Genesis 2. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day, and this was that God did rest on the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if in this place now, if they shall enter into my rest. So he's used that word, if they. Again, there's an if, there's a condition on this particular rest. The author has just linked God's Sabbath rest at the time of creation with a rest that the Israelites missed in the desert. Somehow, conceptually, they have something in common. That's what he's focusing on. The typology of the salvation rest is used to show that Israel failed to enter into the rest by what? By divine decree, because God swore an oath. 
So God could not repent or change it. They had to do what he indicated. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Israel failed to enter in because of unbelief. Nevertheless, the invitation to enter God's rest remains open. It remaineth that some must enter in. So it's still open. Who's it open to? Those that are going to be faithful. It remaineth that some must enter therein. Now let's summarize all this. Though through an exposition from the Old Testament concept of rest, the author exhorted them to hold fast to what? To their confidence in Christ. This was meant to encourage them to face the hardships boldly as the day approaches. What day? When the land would be burned, that's going to be, uh, show up in uh, Hebrews 6, and when the temple worship will disappear, and that's going to be predicted in Hebrews 8. So this is a very contemporary letter specifically tailored to those 38 years between Christ's ministry and the fall of Jerusalem. But it has lessons for all of us. That's why it's here. Using Psalm 95, the author warned that the lack of faith and confidence in Christ could jeopardize their rest similar to what happened to the Exodus generation, potentially resulting in their loss of physical life. Potentially losing physical life. God's rest refers to Israel's worship before the personal presence of yod heh in Psalm 95, which could be forfeited by hardened, rebellious hearts like those of the Exodus generation. What we want to make sure we don't have is hardened hearts where we fail to enter into the promises He's of inheritance he's given us. The readers could still enter into his rest by continuing to place their faith in the life-sustaining presence of God. And the offer of rest is not limited to the Exodus generation because it was first experienced by Adam and Eve in the garden after God rested. And you can get into that by taking, taking a look at chapter, uh, Exodus 2, uh, Genesis 2. Neither was it limited to the occupation of the land under Joshua because David himself, see, it wasn't limited to Adam and Eve, it wasn't just limited to the, uh, the uh, Exodus generation, Numbers 14, no, because David reoffers it, if you will, in Psalm 95, and it's here underscored for us, in effect, in the New Testament, in the Epistle to the Hebrews. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, if so long a time, as it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. This is verse 7 continuing. And so the failure of the Israelites did not nullify that some will enter into that rest. According to God, renewed the offer as late as the time of David. That's important to us. At that time, God call, set, again set a certain day, calling it today, presenting this opportunity to all readers of the psalm for whom today becomes their own today. What's our today? Our today is right now. And uh, today, today, today. So this is, we have it today also. And if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? So see, the Old Testament could have been quoted by as many, to show that the rest had already been uh, entered via the conquest of the land. Josh, that, that, that many people would argue that's foreclosed it. But this is a rebuttal to that, because the writer's rebuttal is simple and sufficient. If it had been so, God would not have spoken later, later about another day. So it's still open is the point. And the psalm, the psalm which you know, forms this text disproves any notion that the test had already been entered into and was no longer open. So... There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Now he turns away from the Canaan rest now to focus on the Sabbath rest. A different Greek word is now used here for this chapter, uh, in this chapter for this rest, uh, sapatismos. And uh, it's only used here in the entire New Testament. It's uh, found elsewhere in Greek literature, uh, but in each case it refers not to the Sabbath day as we think of it, but rather the Sabbath observance or celebration. The view that's emphasized here is that of a celebration, and uh, that's a very interesting perspective. We so often think of this, keeping the Sabbath in the, from the Judaistic legalistic view, don't do this and don't do that. Most of us fail, and some of them fail, to really get the spirit of the Sabbath, which is to celebrate the creation of God. And we can even do that today, is to celebrate the creation of God. And uh, Sabbatismos. It's, it's the emphasis not the cessation of daily activities, but rather the unhindered opportunity for the people to celebrate God's self-sustaining presence among them. That's really the thrust of the Sabbath rest, even in Judaism, if it's done properly. And as such, the Sabbath celebration was meant to be a time of festive praise, including special sacrifices commemorating God's provisions. And that's really what the Sabbath is supposed to be all about, not following 613 rules or whatever. 
Its origin in creation suggests that his Sabbath celebration transcends the rest forfeited by the Exodus generation and enjoyed under David and Joshua. So this rest remains available today to everyone that believes, if we understand what it really embraces. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. So this is in effect the ultimate refutation of what we would call legalism. Trying to please God by following rules is not the point. That's striving fleshly rather than resting in the leading of the Spirit, which is what he's talking about. Ceased from their own works. Entering into God's rest here is ceasing from our works and uh, our own works. We need to model our lives after Jesus Christ who is faithful to the one who appointed him as mentioned earlier in Hebrews 3, and must be careful to hold firmly to, until the end, to the end, the confidence we had at the first. Only then would they be able to rest from the works in the joyful possession of their inheritance in the Messianic kingdom. And by the way, that's a key thought now starting to merge out of all of this. The ultimate rest, the ultimate inheritance is in the, king, the Messianic kingdom. And many people fail to appreciate the book of Hebrews because they don't recognize its, its uh, focus on the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, which of course is what we call the millennium. So here's some of it. We have the creation rest in Genesis 2. We have the Canaan rest that's alluded to not only in Kiddush, Barnea, but in the Psalm and also in this epistle. But the ultimate rest is the millennial rest, which is indeed, of course, yet future all the way. There's a past tense of rest in the sense of our justification, our rest that Christ, our, our, our justification is done 100% by Christ alone. We can't add to it to try to do that as blasphemy. There's a present tense of resting, and that's spiritual maturity, walking by the Spirit and not uh, being under, recognizing we're no longer under the law. And that, boy, that's really going to emerge as we get to uh, uh, chapter 7 and following. And there's an ultimate future tense, the kingdom inheritance. And it's, a, it's, it's very worthwhile to really undertake a study of the kingdom and to recognize there is a kingdom coming. That's what the, the, the angel confirmed to Mary in our Christ, what we call Christmas celebration, the nativity, that her child would sit on the throne of David. The pivotal event in the book of Acts is Acts 15, where they argue what is a Gentile to be saved. And what James quotes is Amos 9 verse 11, is that God is again going to establish the tabernacle of David. The idea of a Davidic kingdom on the planet Earth is what the millennium is all about. There's more prophecy on that period than any other period in the history, in, in the Bible. Let's labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So let us labor. You mean we've got to strive? In a sense, yes. We want to labor to enter into that rest. And uh, it's, it's, this is different than the assurance that all Christians have that we have eternal life and that we will be raised up to enjoy it in the presence of God. There's more to it than just that is the point. You want to be partaking as a metakoi of the Messiah and his dominion over creation by doing his will until the end. So that when, when we appear before that judgment seat of Christ, you can say, well done, good and faithful servant. Everybody before the judgment seat will be saved. Only some will be rewarded for their faithfulness. So we are partakers of Christ if we hold to the beginning of our confidence and steadfast them. Again, here's this, flashing back to chapter 3, verse 14. The metakoi. If, this is critically important, if we hold fast to the end and if we become a metakoi. How do we do that? Well, it's interesting. In the book of Revelation, we have overcomers. Every one of the seven letters has, a, has an overcomer. And they have specific promises of things that they will uh, be, are entitled to by virtue of their faithfulness. And... Uh, what will they get? They'll be clothed in white, be pillars in the Lord's temple, be granted power over the nations, they'll enjoy the tree of life, not be subject to spiritual death, have their names acknowledged by Christ, be fed out of hidden manna, have a white stone with their name, write his own name. All these are worthy of careful study, and they're not, that just because you're saved doesn't mean that you've become an overcomer. That's exactly the thrust of the commitments that are appended to each of those letters and to sit with Christ on his throne. Some will, some won't. How do you become an overcomer? Well, you remain loyal to God, according to uh, Revelation 2, 3. They, they overcame tribulation and remained faithful. They were spiritually zealous. They did not deny Christ. They did not defile their garments. They kept the word of his patience. You know, it's interesting that even Peter denied Christ and, of course, was reinstated before it was all over. 
Did he lose his salvation? No. But he lost his apostleship. Call, tell all the disciples and Peter, Jesus says. And that gets all straightened out, of course, in John 20, you know the story. So there is a chain of inheritance to be conscious of. From sanctification, that leads to partaking. Being a, and the partaking leads to overcoming, and overcoming leads to inheriting. That, that's the chain. Finishing up uh, for the word of we now the, the f final part of this chapter shifts gears a little bit on another emphasis that's very exciting. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, having completed now at this point his exposition of Psalm 95, which all that foregoing had done, and which involves Israel's failure to enter the rest. The writer now br brings this warning, that this what we call warning uh, number two, to a conclusion that is sobering on the one hand and comforting on the other. The Word of God is quick. It's alive. It's alive. And uh, this is the very uh, Greek term that from which we get the word energy. And so on, it's alive and uh, powerful. And uh, uh, powerful is that word that uh, it means active, effectual, powerful. And uh, Isaiah 55, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, and it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and shall prosper to the thing that I send. What a commitment. God's, my word shall not return void. Isaiah 55, 11. Jeremiah 23, 9, is, is not my word like as a fire, the Lord says, uh, like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. And uh, continuing in Hebrews 4, for the word of God is quick and powerful, and, and a sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. Sharper than any two-edged two sword thing is all through the Scripture, by the way. And that's one of the reasons psychology is doomed. Because psychology is trying to e map the internal architecture of an infinite state machine from its external behavior. And that's in, 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 in system engineering uh, a non sequitur. And that's the dilemma that psychology is in because they ha can only deal with the external behavior. They have the, the, you can't discern the archi architecture in an infinite state machine by that kind of behavior. It's well known in the in, uh, engineering world, but not so widely appreciated in a broader sense. The word uh, 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 tomateros is uh, precise, decisive. It's sharp. And uh, Psalm 149, let the praise of God be in their mouth, and two-edged sword in their hand. There's that term again. Um, he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword in Isaiah 49. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, make me polish shaft, and so forth. Take that in Ephesians 6, the armor of God. We have the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which I think most of us are familiar with that idiom. He had his right hand, the seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. How tragic it is that we some artists, classic artists, have tried to paint Christ from Revelation, and they, have, they literally have a and a sword coming out of his mouth. Well, idiomatically, it's, it's a mixing of graphic metaphors, but the point is clearly the word of God is the two-edged sword. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with what? The sword of my mouth. Again, that's him. And uh, even Revelation 19, the climactic one, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed with fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth, a sharp sword that should smite danger. It gets interesting how these idioms are used consistently in both the Old and New Testament. And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet, the miracle form, deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and them that worshiped his name. And they were both cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with what? The, the sword of him that sat upon the earth, the sword which proceeded out of his mouth. There again is the, the, the consistent use of these metaphors. Dividing asunder the soul and the spirit. Most of us use those terms so sloppily, but the soul and the spirit are distinct. And uh, the word psyche or soul and pneuma, breath or spirit, are distinct. But the only way you can discern between them is through the Word of God, not from psychological treatises or what have you. And uh, the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In the Old Testament phrase, it's used the search of the reins in Jeremiah 17 and so on. The word thoughts points to the objective aspect of the thought process. The word intense points to the, subject, in, uh, the subjective aspect of the thinking process. The Word of God can discern between the two what a man is thinking and why he is thinking it. And uh, some people say, why is this in the Scripture? Well, that's to keep us out of the act. 
How often we try to presume intents. Because the Word of God is in all these things, and because the Word will call believers into account someday, these Jewish believers need to give diligence to press on to spiritual maturity. That's the main theme of this entire epistle. Wrapping it up, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Wow, that's disturbing. But all things are naked and open unto him, unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. All Christians will someday stand before the judgment seat of Christ that give account for their lives. And that's we, we picked that up in Romans 14, but also the definitive passage is 2 Corinthians 5.10. It's, it's our destiny. And if at that time their lives are seen to be marked by the kind of failure they have been warned against, they will suffer the loss of reward. Not their salvation, the reward. That's what 1 Corinthians 3 details. We've been through that. Seeing then that we have such a great high priest, that's introducing a topic that's going to be the main topic when we get to chapter 7. Seeing that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. Great high priest. See, there's every reason to hold firmly to the faith we possess because Jesus' priesthood has been already alluded to twice in this, chapter, in this uh, epistle. And we're going to be now moving into those passages that are going to uh, really define and explain what that means to us. For we have not... We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he knows where we're at. He's been there. He's the only one who fully resists temptation can know the extent of its force. Only one who fully resists temptation can know the extent of its force. Therefore, the sinless one has a greater capacity for compassion than any sinner could have for a fellow sinner. That's not obvious until you think about it, but very interesting. It's the only one that resists temptation completely, and there's only one person that's done that. Only the sinless one has a greater capacity for compassion than any sinner could have for a fellow sinner. So from all this, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The throne of grace indeed. So for our next session, Hebrews chapter 5. We're now going to turn to the third pillar of Judaism, the Levitical priesthood. We've been through angels, we've been through Moses, now we're going to go to the priesthood. And we're going to explore the definitive presentations of the ultimate priesthood. We're starting a whole section. Section 5 through 10 is primarily going to deal with the ultimate priesthood, the ultimate uh, covenants, the ultimate, uh, uh, our ultimate high priest. We're also going to encounter next time when we get chapter 5, we're going to set the stage for what many would consider the most troublesome passage in the entire Bible. In chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, there's a passage that taken out of context can be very disturbing. And yet, if we put it in context, in the epistle in general and in the warnings in particular, it'll be surprisingly clear, I believe. But be prepared that warning number three is the watershed issue for many students. So with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for this epistle. We thank you, Father, that your rest is still available to us if we just but understand it. We pray, Father, that you would help each of us to hold fast to our confidence in Christ, to lean on the leading of the Spirit and not rules and rituals. Help us to enter in that we might indeed receive that which you have provided for us as our inheritance. As we commit ourselves into your hands, asking you to strengthen us and guide us to be indeed medicoi, partakers of Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen.